Okay then, welcome back to the Blue Stage. Here with us we have Tommy Tinja from Stockholm and he will give a talk about mob programming. Uh, Tommy is also a, a supporter of open source platforms, so what can you tell us about your support for that kind of... Yeah, I've been coding open source for many years during my spare time. Uh, various projects, Archelian, Jabez Application Server, Apache Tommy, uh, Jenkins Delivery Pipeline Plugin, uh, some other stuff. I like to dig into new problems, uh, new source code, uh, see how they solve different problems and just uh, also to contribute and, you know, it, we don't need to reinvent the wheel all the time at every company, so that's always... There's a lot of already invented out there, so you can just... Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. It it's nice to be able yeah, to contribute, contribute to that. Great, great to have you with us. So have, mm -hmm. a, have a joyful time. And of course, the Q&A Q session will be held on the <coughs> HeapSpace booth behind this stage. Thanks. Cool. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to my talk, A Year of More Programming Tips and Tricks. Um, I hope you all had a great conference so far. I'm glad that so many of you uh, decided to join me to, today in this session. Uh, before we start, I thought we should make sure that we're all on the same page regarding the terminology we're going to use here today in this session. So what is mob programming? Well, what is a mob in the first place? Well, one could think of a mob as uh, organized crime, like the mafia, and mob programming being these bad guys creating computer software to steal all of your money. Uh, Although it could be an interesting conference topic, that's not what we're going to talk about today. So, mob programming uh, is essentially an evolutionary step to pair programming. We have three or more people sitting in the same space at the same time solving the same problem using one shared computer. So that's what we mean with mob programming. Uh, quick introduction to myself, Tom Tunia from Stockholm, Sweden. I work for a Swedish consultancy called Diabol. We help our clients in becoming more efficient in their software development processes. We help them implement continuous delivery, DevOps, agile, and lean ways of working. I work as a software developer myself, also as an agile coach, uh, and I've been coding uh, since I was 11, so I have many years of experience. Uh, and this talk is about my experiences from when I joined the development team, where they just started using mob programming. And uh, we saw some great benefits, and we just started to use that, and it became the de facto way of working in our software development team. And we used this every single workday for over, over a year, without any exceptions. So it's based on my experiences from this. Uh, small disclaimer, I'm no longer part of this development team, even though it might sound like that throughout the presentation. Uh, however, I know that this team is still using more programming even today. But I thought of giving you a little bit of context about the organization where we use this. So I work with one out of uh, 35 development teams, so quite a big organization. But like this talk will focus on one of the teams. Uh, this was a quite uh, mature organization in terms of where they are on the agile journey. So I think that's an important factor. We had a microservices style architecture with around uh, over 100 services running around in production. Uh, my team were, were responsible for 15, 15 of them. And the important part here is that we had teams with end-to-end -end responsibility. So our team were responsible for developing the code, uh, do all the QA, test automation, deployment, operations, on call for it. So no just coding, throwing it over the wall for someone else to handle. We have to handle uh, our own software. So this is kind of the DevOps mentality, so to speak. So this is an, also an important factor. So why am I standing here talking about this? Well, we saw some great benefits from starting out with this. So I hope that this could be an inspiration for you if you haven't never tried doing more programming, to try it out in your organization. And uh, if you have already tried it, maybe this could give you some tips on how to avoid some of the common pitfalls that you are likely to encounter along the way. So let's start from the beginning. Why did we even start with mob programming? Well, the week before I joined the team, we had a few developers who um, attended a conference in town where there was a talk about mob programming and some benefits around that and how productivity increased. So we thought it was interesting. We thought like, we'd like to experiment and try new things. So we thought, why not? Let's try it. Uh, but one of the main concerns we had was, what will our manager think about this? Uh, it's a quite controversial topic to sit all the developers using one shared computer uh, instead of like parallelizing the work. So our manager uh, was actually a good manager who gave us uh, a response that was, I don't really care 
if you're working on your own, if you pair up, working in a mob, sit on top of each other, I don't really care, as long as you're productive, you're delivering what you're supposed to, and you're happy about it. So go ahead and try it out. So in the beginning, we didn't have any process. We didn't really know what we were doing. We happened to have a couch and a TV in our team area next to our desk. So we could just crash down there, sit there, hack away, code together. And uh, uh, it was fun. We felt like there were some uh, productivity gains. The knowledge sharing happened. But it, it was quite exhausting. End of the day, you were quite drained on energy. And uh, uh, it, we got a lot of uh, strange looks around the organization. Why are you sitting together instead of uh, paralyzing the work and everybody works on their own machines and so on? Um, and we got comments like, oh, we tried more programming for one day in our development team. It didn't really work for us. But you have to remember that this is not something you can buy off the shelf, apply it, and think it will work from day one. It's like saying, oh, we tried Agile for one day. It didn't really work for us. So you have to give it a try, give it a go, uh, work with this continuously in your continuous improvement efforts to make it work. Um, and for some teams, uh, it can be quite hard because they don't have even a good space where they can actually work together. So at least in Stockholm, uh, many companies, they have uh, uh, hard to find a conference room. So even if you find, manage to find a conference room, they can book for the full day for a team to do programming on. It might not be that popular in your organization if uh, your desks are sitting idle while you're, you're booking all the conference rooms for programming. So, but I think more programming, it might not suit all, all the development teams, but I think it can suit for a lot of different development teams. And in this kind of presentation, it's very common to hear like just success stories, everything was you know, great, it was just a straight road. Um, but to be honest, we had to pay a lot of attention to this to make this work. Uh, we really believe that this could be a good way of working. So we had retrospectives every second week. And most of the retrospectives, we had some kind of uh, talk around how to improve our process, how to fine tune it, uh, how to turn up the good stuff that works, how to improve the stuff that didn't work, and so on. So we had a lot of ups and downs, twists and turns, and so on, um, uh, to come to where we were in the end. So it was quite a muddy road at times. So I thought I should share some of the pitfalls that uh, you're likely to encounter if you start with more programming that uh, happened to us and how we solve them going forward. So one of the first things that can happen is that everybody's working together or like start talking and it feels like you're in the middle of a hen house. Everybody just keeps talking all the time on top of each other. People have to show off that, oh, I know the business logic the best and somebody has to show off their uh, deep knowledge in the JVM garbage collector or whatever. And it can be really exhausting and I can definitely see that people get turned off by this in the beginning uh, because it's not really productive um, and it's uh, quite intense. So you have to remember to focus on flow because you're sitting together working on sh solving an actual problem. So what is the problem you're actually trying to solve and are those discussions you're having, are they actually contributing for you to reach that goal? Maybe you should write down the problem you're trying to solve on a whiteboard next to you so you can always point to that. And if you're a lot of people, you're always somebody who's going to notice like, hey, let's have a timeout. We're derailing our discussion. We should do this instead. Focus on getting forward, getting progress on the things you're working on. And one thing that we noticed uh, quite quickly was that kind of agreements on coding standards quite evolved naturally. And, uh, of course, we had some heated uh, debates about coding standards, but I think that was quite healthy. Uh, because sometimes you can notice in, in different code bases that you can definitely tell that different developers wrote different parts of code. Like one person is more particular about how they name their methods. So this part of the code looks a little bit different than this part of the code, where somebody that's sloppy with indentation has been writing. And as developers, we spend a lot of time uh, reading source code, so it, it makes maintenance and development much easier if the code base is coherent and it, it looks the same. And we reached that point, but then we ran into a problem. So if we sometimes want to troubleshoot something and see who actually introduced a certain code change when we went back in version control, we felt we couldn't really trust the name of the author that was in the commit logs because we didn't really know was this a part of like when we did the mob work or uh, was that person even around or did we just happen to use that person's computer? How do we know 
which developers were actually part of this code change because we have, want to have full traceability and also um, have at least two pair of eyes on each code change. We have to want to verify this as well. So we solved this in a quite simple way. We just decided to have a naming convention or a convention for git commit messages that on the second line of each commit message, we would write down all the names of the persons that were involved in this particular code change. And then we would have a git commit hook in our upstream repository, which would verify that we actually specified some names on the second line, and these names actually match name of persons within the team at that point in time. So we could always know who were involved in this particular code change. Another problem that uh, you're likely to encounter, and this happens when you do pair programming as well, I've seen that a lot when I'm doing pair programming, is that one person tends to hold on to the keyboard for way too long, which makes that the other persons, the per person or persons next to uh, the one with the keyboard, they don't feel like they're participating as much, maybe don't feel as engaged, in the end they're gonna get bored or like it's hard to keep up and keep, uh, be focused. And like some of the both pros and cons with more programming, the kind of like in that environment it kind of amplifies. So if you have problems in a mob setting, it will get worse. So uh, as a developer, also we feel like we're most productive when we actually have the keyboard doing the typing. Uh, it's kind of a, um, a mindset which can gradually change over time if you work uh, in a mob setting for an extended period of time. So we solve this by just having an egg clock or a timer. So we just set the timer for maybe five or six minutes. And once the timer went off, the person at the keyboard just lifted their hands off the keyboard, passed it along to the next person, and then we could just rotate around. So everybody felt involved. Uh, in, in some sense, this also created some engagement because if you know you're getting the keyboard in a few minutes, you, you better be prepared to get on with the work, continue the development, uh, be focused and concentrate on what's happening. Uh, we tried with a physical uh, egg timer, but our neighbors went completely crazy and thought we were nuts. So we, we just installed a uh, plug into our ID uh, with a timer that would just fire up a big screen, like time's up, uh, time to rotate the keyboard. So this worked really well for us. Everybody felt engaged and so on, but still it wasn't really perfect. Uh, because we work like this from maybe 9 to lunch, from lunch to uh, the afternoon, and I know, you know, pe people have needs still. Uh, it's hard to just sit for an extended period of time being that concentrated. Sometimes people need to go to the restroom, for instance, or get a coffee, or uh, get a banana, or whatever. And sometimes you could sit there with the keyboard in the mob, and you notice that half the mob was gone to get coffee or something, the other half, there were just uh, completely exhausted, they stared at their phones doing something else instead. And uh, as, a, as a, the one with the keyboard, they were like, what am I doing here? I'm mean, surrounded by a bunch of zombies. This is not what we're supposed to do. This is not productive. Uh, that's a zombie programming. That's not more programming. So we decided to try something called the Pomodoro technique. So if you haven't heard of the Pomodoro technique, it's essentially about dividing your workday into 30-minute segments where you work focused on one particular task for 25 minutes, and then you take a five minute break to just get your mind off the problem, think of something else, go get a coffee, um, and take a lap around the block, do whatever, don't think about the problem. Once you get back from the break, you either pick up the previous task if you haven't finished it, or you pick up the next task if you finished the previous one. And it was really great for us to drive engagement and feel like everybody's constantly engaged because we knew that when we got into the mob, we're going to work focused for 25 minutes and then we're going to get a chance to have a break, get coffee, make that phone call we need to make or whatever. And then when we get back in the mob, we can work concentrated again. So it's also sometimes hard to create these habits when we're trying out new things, uh, you have to constantly remind yourself of the ways of working and working agreements you've decided upon in your team. So in order to help with this, we create a checklist that reminds us of these stuff that we've agreed upon in our team. Because as humans, it typically takes us 60 days to create new habits. So we have to constantly remind ourselves of these new habits. Um, and we just create a checklist that we printed out that 
like put it on the wall next to our TV in our team area, so we could constantly be reminded of these things that we agreed upon until they became habits. So one of the things was that in the beginning we used different kind of computers. I used a Mac, for instance, when I developed, and half the team did. The other half used Linux computers, and not everybody was comfortable using a Mac. And to be honest, when we used Macs, uh, we all had different key sets in, um, or key maps in our IDE, uh, different shortcuts and so on. So it's really hard to just pass around the keyboard and be productive. So we felt, okay, we can all feel comfortable using a Linux box, so let's always make sure that the computer we program on is a Linux machine. A default key map in the IDE, the same terminal shortcuts should be available, and so on. We remind ourselves of using the timer to always have regular breaks, to work focusedly, have discipline, focus on flow, uh, not getting caught up in derailed discussions, uh, scope creep, and these kind of things, and to have a lot of fun while, while um, working together. So this worked really well, and we used this kind of way of working with a timer for, for many, many months, and it was essentially just like a half year later when we discovered something called strong pairing. And strong pairing comes from pair programming, and we essentially used the same concept in, you know, when we mob programmed. And it's about you have a driver who's the one with a keyboard and a navigator who's uh, having the ideas of how to solve the particular problem you're working on. So the person at the keyboard sh should not be the one that has an idea how to solve problems, because that's what typically happens. Like, I have an idea. Give me the keyboard. I'll show you. People start coding away. It's really hard for people to code, explain at the same time. All the others are just sitting there, seeing by on the screen. There's some screen juggling going on, and like, what's happening? So instead, you have the navigator talking in a high abstraction level about the problem you're trying to solve, and the driver is just acting as a translator from spoken language into something that the computer can understand, which is source code. So I can illustrate this with an example. Imagine that you're in a car, and you have a driver and a navigator. The driver is driving the car. The navigator don't need to tell you specifics on how to operate the car. So if you're driving here from Belgrade to Athens, you don't need to tell the driver to, now you need to turn the wheel to the left to go to the left lane, and then you need to press the throttle, shift up, because we're only to overtake that Fiat in the right lane, then we're going to have to go back to the right lane. You only need to say, let's get on this freeway, look for this exit sign, we take this, num this exit number, head on to, to the next freeway, uh, follow the signs. Because I mean, we trust the driver to know how to operate the car or how to write software. Otherwise, we wouldn't put them there in a the driver's seat in the first place. So sometimes we just gave the keyboard to the person who was most confused about what to do. And the other ones who had an idea how to solve this problem could just start talking about this and describing in a high abstraction level for the driver what to code. And the driver can obviously ask questions as well as along the way to clarify things. But we're all humans. I mean, everything is not perfect. We, one week we had uh, two critical bugs. Uh, it was really, really not common that we had the, uh, them in the same week like that. Uh, it affected our customers. Uh, so as an agile coach for that team, I decided to focus on that next retrospective on code quality. And we noticed that even though we did all of our test automation ourselves, um, and that was like our safety net for all of our services. Uh, we really could trust these test suites we had. Um, we, we noticed that we didn't really do TDD as in writing tests first. So we thought, like, let's do an experiment for two weeks and just write the tests first always. And the best thing, we, we have a, a bunch of people working together. It's always somebody that's going to remember and remind you if you're not writing the test first. Like, oh, wait a minute, you're writing production code, write the test first. And this way, we got to increase the code quality, but we noticed a really interesting side effect, which, which, were, which was very beneficial, and that was that before we even started coding, we could set the expectations together on what we're trying to solve, how to tackle the problem. Sometimes we have misunderstood what we're supposed to do. We could grind that out in, in, immediately before like, writing all this production code, write the tests, and then realize these corner cases didn't work, and then we just need to uh, do a lot of rework. 
So this is what it looks like when we started out with more programming. We just uh, happened to have this lousy couch in our team area and uh, in, a, in a quite big screen TV where we could try it out. So uh, it wasn't really ideal. I mean, it, it works, but I mean, if you sit there for eight hours a day, you start to get back problems. And you know, we can't even fit the whole team in the couch. I mean, we can fit three, max four people. More than that, it's uncomfortable if you're Swedish. So we, when we finally figured out that this is something that we really want to do, we just talked with our office manager and make sure to upgrade so we could have a proper table, so people could actually bring in their own office chairs with their, uh, the right adjustments and so on. So here we could sit together, we had the whiteboards and so on, and, and just work together all day long, solving problems together as a team. And we use continuous delivery ways of working. So more programming is not, is not requiring continuous delivery or the other way around. But I think we have some great leverage from having this in place. And there are essentially two requirements for you uh, that you need to fulfill in order for you to do continuous delivery. And the first thing is that your source code should always be working. It should always be in a releasable state. So you don't want to wake up in the middle of the night if you're having on-call, you need to push a change through the pipeline and notice that the, the build is broken, for instance. You want to be able to have working software all the time. The second thing is that your whole delivery process should be fully automated. So you can have like a manual approval step before going to production. We didn't have that. We used continuous deployment. So every time we did a Git push, to, we would trigger automatic builds, run all the unit tests, component tests, subsystem tests, regression tests. Um, if we pass that gatekeeping, we go on to deploy that to different environments and eventually in production. So after Git push, if it passed all the gatekeeping, it would be out in the hands of the users in less than 30 minutes. So great, great uh, short feedback loop for us. So you can imagine us sitting here, working together, making small incremental code changes to the thing we're working on, and just push those. And then we have our continuous delivery pipelines on top right-hand side. And we can just follow our code chains going through our pipelines. So we use Jenkins as our CI CD tool, not important, but we use the Jenkins delivery pipeline plugin to visualize these pipelines. And we, you can configure that one so it always shows running pipelines on top. So regardless of which repository we commit to, we can always see the builds are triggered, kicked off, run through the pipeline. And the best thing is that we don't need to go into any UI, follow logs or anything to find out where our code change is. We don't even need to look at this. It's just um, subconsciously we see what's happening. And if, if it fails, it will be red. We will notice that. It will always, red pipelines will always show up on top on this screen as well. So we never, uh, they never go unnoticed. And since we always want working software, our working agreement in team is to fix it immediately. And to be honest, it's quite easy if you're already in the context of that particular problem. You're working on that, it fails, it's easy to just address that problem, roll forward. But it's some, sometimes uh, you make mistakes, you miss certain test cases, for instance, and uh, things go out in production, something goes haywire. We have our production monitoring on the top left-hand screen, so we can have fast feedback to see whether our, our software is working as expected or not. Uh, if something hits production, um, which has a, a negative impact, we can quickly roll back to the previously known good version, address that, roll forward. And we use trunk-based development. Uh, and I think, uh, for me, I think working on branches, long-lived branches, uh, is not really efficient or productive because when your code changes actually bring value, it's when they're in production in the hands of the users. And in order for, to get to production, they need to be in the master branch. And you want to have your con code constantly integrated. That's essentially continuous integration. And we've had that in the industry for almost 20 years now. So it shouldn't be any a controversial topic. And CD, continuous delivery, is essentially just an extension of continuous integration. So typically, if you see people working on branches, they do testing on the branches, and as soon as somebody commits something on master, it totally invalidates all the stuff and all the testing you've done on your branch, and you have to redo that. So prefer to just merge to master. And to be honest, if we're all working on the same thing anyway, it doesn't really matter. We can just work on master anyway. So some of the benefits 
uh, that we notice with uh, mob programming. The first thing is that the mob is like a bulldozer. There's always constant progress on uh, the thing you're working on. It doesn't really matter if somebody is sick or uh, on vacation. Uh, if somebody comes and bothers us with a question, one person could answer them. Uh, the, the work is continuously uh, going forward. It's always going to be constant um, uh, progress on thing you're working on. A common misconception is that you can't work in parallel. You can do that, but you do that in a little bit different way than you used to. It's just that you're working on the same problem. So let, let me give you an example. For instance, imagine that you're working on a new REST API endpoint, and you need to do some business logic, code that in Java, and somebody realizes that in 10 minutes' time, we're going to need a new SQL query and implement that. Then one person from the mob could just pop up their laptop, preferably the SQL guru, develop that, uh, test that out, and when the mob gets to that point that they actually need to implement this SQL query, it's already done. So you can work in parallel, but you're working on the same problem. And the main, main benefit is that we can use all the brain power we have in our team, all the skills, uh, all the experience we have, uh, to take in all the different aspects we need to cover in order to create quality software for our users. So, especially in our team, we have end-to-end -end responsibility. Uh, we're not all the same. We all have our different uh, specialities or area of expertise. We want to make use of that as much as possible. So, let me demonstrate this with an example. So, a simplified example. Um, I've identified four core skills that you need uh, to master in order to take in all the different aspects you need to cover uh, to create quality software for our users. So for instance, you need to know Java because all of our stuff runs on the JVM. Uh, we do all the test automation ourselves. So you need to do you know, TDD test automation. We run all of our stuff on AWS, so you need to be familiar with that in some sense. And you need to have some kind of sense for basic operation skills. Like if you're doing continuous deployment, and essentially each code change is uh, a release candidate that can go to production, you have to think about stuff like What's going to happen with that code change hits production? Do I have the necessary monitoring, metrics, tracing, health checks in place? These kind of things. You need to think about that. Feature switching, circle breakers, and so on. So imagine that you have one person uh, working on one item in the backlog, one particular feature, and this person is so-so uh, on Java, not that good on TDD, uh, a lot of experience on AWS, but doesn't really have this ops thinking. If they're going to deliver this feature by themselves, there are going to be some obvious gaps here. Uh, the feature could be, uh, could be, be like better, had more quality, and so on. But what if this person would pair program with someone that has these op skills and this experience? Well, then they would cover much more, m m many more aspects, and they create much better software. Uh, but there's still some gaps here. So what if we add a third person to the pair, and it becomes a mob, a person that preferably is a Java guru and knows TDD a lot, but maybe doesn't know about AWS or Ops, but uh, these people can work together then to cover all different aspects and make sure that we create quality software for our users. One of the benefits was also that uh, anyone in the team could represent us in meetings. So sometimes we had meetings with other teams, we need to send a representative. We could just decide in the morning who, who would go. Sometimes we just picked a random name out of a hat. Um, knowledge sharing just happened all the time. And in fact, most meetings were eliminated in, anyway, uh, because we were all there working together. So decisions and discussions just happened there and then. We didn't need to wait until the most senior person was back from vacation or, uh, oh, there's no conference rooms this week. We have to postpone that meeting for decision until next week when we have a conference room. This is just like silly constraints that puts, uh, makes it everything just more, much more inefficient. And uh, at least us, we don't really like to spend much of our coding time in meetings. I don't know about you, but uh, I prefer to be productive and creative instead. And another important aspect is that our product owner was super happy about this setup. As developers, we might not always think about it from a product owner's perspective, but imagine that if in a typical environment, if you have like five persons working on five different things, a product owner doesn't really 
want to see five different things move slowly across the Kanban board every day for several weeks until they're done. They just want the top most prioritized thing finished and in the hands of the users as soon as possible. They don't, might not even care about the second most prioritized thing today. Tomorrow, maybe that's not even relevant anymore because maybe we didn't sign with that customer we were building this feature for. And, but if we already started working on that, maybe, maybe we want to finish that and so on. And priorities just change so quickly in, in um, big organizations as well. So have this kind of flexibility in your backlog to always work on top prioritized thing uh, and then be able to pull up something new that just pops up from the side and finish that one the next. Gives you a lot of agility and flexibility. So a common question I get is, um, like, how many persons should you be in a mob? Is there a, a silver bullet? So unfortunately, there's no good answer to that. I think it depends on the context. Um, in our case, we were typically between five and seven developers in our development team. Uh, we think like five people were probably the sweet spot for us. It might differ for you. At seven, we felt like we were a little bit too many, so then we usually divide ourselves into a, a mob and a pair, a pair programmed. Uh, but typically, the mob was much more productive. Then we typically just, uh, in the morning stand-up, we just decided who works on what thing. Another important aspect is um, to have a def definition of ready when it's actually okay to start working on a particular feature. I think like in Agile, in Agile movement, we spend a lot of time typically to discuss the definition of done, like when are we actually done with the ticket. And in my experience, we still end up in these discussions whether something is done, is it done, done, or is it done, 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 and nobody knows ever. But having a definition of ready, which states, for instance, that you cannot start working on a particular uh, ticket uh, or feature without knowing how to solve it, for instance. So if you can't really describe the problem, you'll never find a solution to it. So that really helps us in, uh, helps us in being productive when we start working. We also didn't want to have dependencies on other teams because we don't want to start working and notice that the other team hasn't finished their feature we're going to integrate with and we're going to have this on hold for a while. We also want to make sure that each ticket that we create in our issue tracker is essentially, can be completed in less than three days. If there's a bigger feature that involves a lot of tickets, we just divide them into smaller segments because then we can put it in a much more better way, uh, have some more flexibility in the planning. The real cost in software development is not about writing the code, it's about actually solving the problem. And it's all the waste we do and all the rework. So if we can minimize that, uh, we're far more productive. So with these different concepts that I've talked about today, we were able to increase our productivity four times. So we went from 12 tickets a month, we were the typically ratio that we uh, were able to cover before we started mob programming, when we worked either by ourselves or pair programmed, uh, to when we started mob programming, we were on for four times more productive and we had uh, data in our issue tracker to back this up. And this was without changing the ticket size. So, one important factor as well is we really felt like we worked together as a team. Like, we talk a lot about development teams in our, organ like in, in our industry, but are we really working together as a team or are we as a group of people that happens to have uh, a common goal? So, it's really important to create um, a good environment which is prestigeless, where people can trust each other, be, have this psychological safety as well, so uh, you can be open, honest, and work together and just realize that you're in the same boat, have this DevOps mentality of work together. Uh, we had so much fun doing this, and uh, I hope this could be some kind of inspiration for you to try this out. So uh, with this said, I want to thank you very much for listening, and if you have any questions, I'll be around here after the talk. Thank you very much.